Well, good morning, church. It's so, so good to have you with us. Uh, my name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here at Westside. Uh, it's a joy to be joined by Pastor Dave from Coastal and Pastor Justin from First. Uh, this is very, very special to us uh, to be together to celebrate, to remember uh, the death, the crucifixion, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, it, it, the, the Old Testament describes unity of God's people as something precious. And, and it is precious to us that we're here together. Jesus said uh, that one of the ways that the world would know that we belong to him and that he was sent from God is by our unity. And so we're just so thankful to have you in the room with us today. Uh, I'm so thankful for these churches. And if you're from any other church in Vancouver, uh, mm -hmm. welcome here. Uh, it's so good that around the city we're remembering the crucifixion of Jesus together today. Yes, and th thank you, Pastor Matthew, and the whole team at Westside for welcoming us and hosting us. Fantastic job. So good to be with you today. Really, really appreciate that. 
And uh, I just I can't agree more that today, I, I think our Father is pleased. I think He loves it when we gather together in unity. Just like any dad is glad or any families are glad when we're gathered together. And uh, it's a blessing to one another. It's also, I think, a blessing, as you mentioned, to our city. Our city sees something. It's very attractive. Unity is attractive. So it's great to, to gather together today. Yes, yeah, so I was, um, I was at a mall getting a gift for my, my wife for her birthday. And uh, in the middle of shopping, I got an email from Pastor Matt. And so I had written to him about how I was just really grateful that uh, Westside was taking that extra load of hosting. And um, yeah, Pastor Matt just wrote saying, uh, no extra load, it's a joy to have family over. Mm. And That's a good way <laughs> to put it. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's just, it's just like I was moved in my spirit. <laughs> Yeah, and I, it's, that rarely happens to me in, a, in Metrotown, but <laughs> <laughs> appreciate it. And thank you. So, and Pastor Dave, always, you know, in my decade of being at first, mm -hmm. we've done this. This is our eighth time. So it's incredible, mm -hmm. like, how, you know, what God can do uh, by us coming together in worship. And so right. thank you very much. Yes. Brother, I appreciate it. Friends, would you join me in prayer? Living God, we thank you. Thank you very much for the po power of your cross. It is because of the power of your cross that we're all here. It is also because of the power of your cross that we have confidence that you are here with us. And so we ask the spirit, we ask uh, that your spirit will lead us, uh, empower Pastor Matt, empower Pastor Dave as they open up the word, uh, empower the choir, uh, Mark, uh, Brad and Paul and the team, as we pay, partake in communion, uh, in every aspect of our worship, we ask that your spirit lead us and lead us to an encounter with Jesus today. We thank you, Lord. We praise you. All glory to you. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. A reading of Psalm 22, a psalm of David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, and I'm not silent. Yet, you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. In you, our fathers put their trust. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried to you and were saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I'm a worm and not a man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Yet yeah, you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth, I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. Would you please stand with us?
praise and honor unto you, Jesus. Would you please be seated? Psalm 22, 11 to 21. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near me, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions tear their prey open, their mouths wide against me. I'm poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax, it is melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircle me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions and save me from the horns of the wild oxen.
Matthew 27, 22 to 54. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, let him be crucified. And he said, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to eat yourselves. And all the people answered, his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put him in a scarlet robe on him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. And when they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of skull, place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink, mixed with gall. But when he tested it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. And if you're the son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and the elders mocked him saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we'll believe in him. He trusts in God, let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. Thank you for that reading. And once again, it's so good to be together as churches as we reflect on the meaning behind Good Friday. Today I want to share on the last words of Jesus as recorded in the Gospels. Over the course of history, there are perhaps 
different last words that people spoke that really revealed what was in their heart, what their life was all about. The last words of the famous painter Picasso was, drink to me. P.T. Barnum, the creator of the greatest show on earth, the Barnum and Bailey Circus, had these last words when he died. How were the receipts at Madison Square Garden today? He knew where his heart was at. Sir Winston Churchill, the greatest statesman who was famous for his commencement address, never, never give up. When he died in 1965, these were his last words. I'm bored with it all. Well, I don't think our Lord was bored in any way. He was thinking about something very much different. His heart was revealed and his words spoke of what he really had for all of us. And not only did his words matter in that way, his last words also give us a great reminder of how we can live our lives. There are seven recorded sayings. If there are more, we don't know, but seven is a number in the Bible that represents completeness and wholeness. So Dr. Luke records the first words we hear Jesus speak at the cross where he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. These initial words that he uttered really underscore the reason why he came, and that was for forgiveness. Hanging on the cross, Jesus was not thinking about himself. He was thinking about the sins of the world. He was thinking about you and I. He makes no threat. He doesn't complain about all the discomfort that he's in. And in the face of unimaginable suffering, what is he doing? He's extending mercy to his, those that are torturing him. He is thinking about and offering forgiveness for his disciples who fled at night. He's offering forgiveness to those that shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, and later would shout, crucify him, crucify him. He's offering forgiveness to his religious enemies there on the cross, to the soldiers who nailed him to the cross. Yet his forgiveness, it knows no bounds. It's past, present, and future. It wasn't just for those that were there on that day he was crucified. That extends to you and I. This was for us that he offered forgiveness. His act of forgiveness on the cross will challenge us. Challenge us to examine how we forgive. To let go of our envy. To let go of our bitterness and our resentment. To let go of our judgment to let go of our hatred, and rather, like Jesus, as he demonstrates there, embrace a spirit of forgiveness, a spirit of compassion, and a spirit of reconciliation. Next, we hear Jesus say to the thief beside him, truly, I say to you, today, you'll be with me in paradise. From this, we learn Jesus is very focused. He's on a mission to build a bridge of redemption for mankind. His promise of paradise to this repentant thief serves as a powerful testament to his boundless grace and to his mercy for us. Now the word paradise, it's a Persian word, and it meant a walled garden. And the deal was a king would say to somebody, you can come to this paradise. And the paradise was a place not just that you had access to, but it meant that the king wanted to walk and talk with you in his garden. And so when he says today, you'll be with me in paradise, it's not just offering him eternal life, immortality. He's saying, today you're going to walk with me in my garden. And that makes us think about Adam walking with God in the cool of the garden. And God wants us to be with him in heaven for eternity. And we will we'll enjoy his companionship. What Jesus says here compels us to participate in God's mission of reconciliation, reaching out to those who are on the margins, extending hope to the lost, the last, and to the least. It's a reminder that the worst sinner can be saved. We all have to decide. Both of those thieves made a decision that day. And perhaps on this Good Friday, it's your time to make a decision on who Jesus is. In the next statement, we see that Jesus is full of compassion John records that Jesus looks down from the cross and says to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he says to John, behold your mother. So even in the darkest hour, he is prioritizing those that mean a lot to him, those that he loves. Just another example of a sacrificial love. 
It is interesting to know that he says to his mother, he calls her woman instead of mom or mother. I think the reason is because she too would have to recognize him as Lord of Lords to receive the freedom that he would purchase for her. What Jesus does, he reminds us to consider our own relationships and our responsibilities, to care for those that are entrusted to us, to bear one another's burdens, to extend compassion, support to those in need. It reminds us that true discipleship, real discipleship is not some grand gesture that we post on Instagram. True discipleship is when we just really care and bear one another's burdens. In the next recorded words of Jesus, we see how much he values communion with the Father. He, in anguish, says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's a cry of abandonment on the cross that really echoes the anguish of his separation from the Father. It's profound despair that we really have a hard time understanding. The greatest pain that Jesus encountered at the cross was not the physical pain. The greatest pain that he encountered was that separation from his heavenly father. The darkness, as we heard read, lasted for three hours. And that darkness that was there really just was a representation of the darkness that would be all around his soul during that time. Corinthians we read, for God made Christ who never sinned to be an offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. So his, his cry there is a challenge for you and I, a challenge to recognize the cost of our redemption, to embrace it and the grace that he offered us through Christ's sacrifice. And we wanted to cultivate our communion with the Heavenly Father even as Jesus showed us. In the next words, we're reminded of Jesus' humanity as he says, I thirst. Although Jesus was divine, he was uniquely human and felt all the emotions and pain as we feel. Execution by crucifixion, that was a long drawn out process. It wasn't like being sh shot with a gun. It was, it was a lingering death under a hot sun. As we heard from Psalm 22, it speaks prophetically and it speaks graphically of his condition. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is turned like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. And so in this moment, he identifies with our weakness, our, our vulnerabilities. And he, he's bridging the gap between the divine and the human. And so it's a declaration, it's a challenge that we recognize the humanness of others around us. His next words, they reveal that he was determined to finish his destiny. John records these famous last words, it is finished. It's good to note that he didn't say, I am finished. He says, it is finished. It was a shout of victory, a shout of victory over sin, victory over death, victory over hell. Aren't you thankful for that? The sacrifices of this, of, and the, all those ceremonies of the Old Testament, all those sacrifices, all those ceremonies, they were but types pointing to Jesus. Now he had come, and the shadow that was there in the past had given, given way to the substance, and it really was happening. That which had been promised for centuries was now being realized. The Word tells us that there's nothing left for us to do but to enter into the results of what Christ's finished work is. And this declaration here, it challenged us to embrace the fullness of Christ's victory, to live in his freedom, to live in his power, to walk in the newness of life, to tell others the good news. Because you know what, you guys, nothing, nothing, Paul writes, can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus' final words were this, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It's a total act of surrender and trust. He exemplifies his obedience, lays down his life willingly on the altar for you and I. It's an ultimate act of trust. And it's a good reminder for us that we too need to surrender our lives, surrender our cares, surrender our anxieties, even surrender our purpose, the purpose for our life, to surrender it to him. So, the seven last sayings of Jesus on the cross, powerful words that respect, re reflect his, his life, that reflect his heart. 
It gives us a glimpse into what his character and his mission was. On this Good Friday, they challenge us to follow our Lord and the example he gave us on the last moments on the cross. The worship team is going to come and we're going to sing about this cross, the old rugged cross. I invite you to stand if you're able. Let's sing together. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross. The dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I. cross I will ever be true it's shame and reproach gladly bear then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling.
can have a seat. Psalm 22, verse 22 to 26. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendant of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendant of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. We pray for us. Father, we love you. We love you, Lord. We are, we are the people called by your name. We thank you for your church. We thank you for your church in this city. Father, we thank you for your love for us expressed in sending your son to that cross. And Jesus, we thank you for your, your life, your death, even your resurrection, Jesus. We thank you that when you ascended to the right hand of your father and you sat on your throne, that you poured out your spirit. And Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and work. Come and move in power. We are your people. We are your people, Lord. We want you to have us, to consume us, to save hundreds of thousands more in the lower mainland, in this province, we ask. Would you apply the work of the cross, the finished work of the cross, the power of the blood of Jesus poured out like water, or to apply to us and to our neighbors the power of your blood, Jesus, in your name. Amen. We've been hearing from Psalm 22 as we've gone through today, and it's a really perfect psalm for Good Friday because the New Testament authors take four separate verses and multiple times will quote uh, Psalm 22 in connection with Jesus' crucifixion. We also have the author of Hebrews quoting from Psalm 22 as he looks at the results what Jesus accomplished on the cross. And I want to walk you through those quotations. But first you have to know that Psalm 22 was written by David. And as you've been hearing, it's a psalm of lament. It is a vivid description of deep suffering and merciless torment at the hands of others while they gloat, mock, and inflict pain beyond measure. And it was the words of Psalm 22 verse 1 that rushed into the heart. And out of the mouth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as he suffered in agony on the cross. It was Psalm 22, 1 that was hidden in his heart that came out of his mouth. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is the deepest, darkest, most anguished cry that the human heart can express. Being forsaken by God. As Pastor Dave said today, the greatest pain Jesus endured was not the physical pain of the cross, but the spiritual separation from his father. Church, Jesus is surrounded here by his tormentors. They're mocking him while his wrists and his feet are nailed to the cross. Jesus' body is coming apart at the seams in searing agony. But where is his heart? Like where are Jesus' eyes? What is it that Jesus, the one that we love, what is it that he is thinking about in his agony on the cross? Church, it is his father. His heart is full of his father, his love for his father. Jesus wasn't primarily consumed by physical pain. No, his primary anguish was rooted in his love for his father and in his feeling being forsaken. But notice his words, into his heart, out of his mouth, my God. Not once, but twice, my God, my God. 
Jesus feels forsaken, but Jesus refused to let go of his father. Like I just see like Jacob wrestling with God, refusing to let go all night. Jesus on the cross, he felt forsaken. In a very real way, he was forsaken, yet he refused to yield his identity. He refused to yield his inheritance or the source of his life. He would not let go. My God, my God, why? Why? Jesus asks, why? It's the right question. And it's a question that comforts every single one of us who lives to follow Jesus in this life. This comforts us because we often wonder why. But, but hearing why as an overflow of the heart of Jesus reminds us that he came to be our high priest. He came to sympathize with us. He came to willingly offer himself as a perfect sacrifice for our sin. As John the Baptist said, church, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Then Matthew, Mark, and Luke each quote Psalm 22 verses 7 and 8 where we see how Jesus was treated in his perfect faithfulness. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him for he delights in him. Wagging their heads was an expression of pure disgust. As Matthew puts the words of those around the cross who were disgusted at the sight of Jesus. He says it like this. He, he puts their words like this in Matthew 27, 43. He trusts in God. Let, him, let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. Those who were disgusted at the sight of Jesus said, let God deliver him now if he desires him. Do you, do you see what this means? It means that to the vast majority of those at the foot of the cross that day, Jesus' crucifixion was decisive, irrefutable evidence that God had forsaken him, that the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob wanted nothing to do with this man who would claimed to be his son. It was decisive evidence that Jesus was a fraud, a charlatan, and not the son of God as he had claimed. Church, Jesus was put on display as the curse. He became our sin. And a symbol of what it looks like to be a conquered enemy, which is why all four gospels quote Psalm twenty-two, eighteen: 18, they divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. In those days, the spoils, the, 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 the cus it was customary that the, that the clothing, the garments of the victims were the spoils of the executioners. This means, this line tells us that in the eyes of the soldiers, Jesus was an enemy now vanquished, defeated, overthrown. Again, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then Psalm 22 changes. There's a shift in Psalm 22. And we just began to hear it read. And we'll hear the rest of it this morning. The next quotation in the New Testament from Psalm 22 comes from Hebrews. And this is a mind-numbingly beautiful scene. This is a scene where the eternal father is is having a conversation with, with his divine son. Actually, the language in Hebrews speaks more to them singing over each other than simply speaking. We're, we're, we're let in here on, on a window into a conversation, a post-resurrection conversation between father and son. 
First the father says, sings over his son in Hebrews 1.8. The father says to his son, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companion. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And then the son responds to his father, beginning with these words from Psalm 22. I will tell of your name, Jesus replies to his father. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, look. I and the children God has given me. This quotation from Psalm 22 and from the book of Hebrews is the key to understanding the cross. This is why we call Good Friday good. Because regardless of what it looked like to anyone there that day, regardless even of what it felt like to Jesus, our King, the father loved his son as much as the son loved his father. The crucifixion wasn't the end. That's why Psalm 22 includes Jesus celebrating the results of the cross. What results? Church, it's us. It's us. It's you filled with the spirit of God. It's us made alive. It's us who have become Jesus' brothers and sisters, sons and daughters of God. And, and this quotation from Hebrews tells us that Jesus is in the midst of the congregation. He is in the midst of his bride, the church. Gatherings just like this. He is here with us right now by his spirit. And he is... He is inviting us to sing. Jesus is inviting us to sing. It is up to us now, church. This is our time, in this time, in this place, to give the Lamb the reward of his suffering. And so we're going to sing and worship him. And as we do, remember that this is what Jesus wants. The desire of his heart is for us to worship his Father right along with him, alive in his spirit. Let's worship. claim its victory the king of love had given up his life the darkest day in history they were on a cross they made for sinners for every curse is blood
friends, would you be seated, please? I think one of the joys of being a pastor, and I think, you know, it will reson resonate with you, Pastor Matt, uh, Pastor Dave, Pastor Cheryl, is watching dead people who've been made alive in Christ worshiping Jesus. Like there's just no other greater joy than in the heart of a pastor. And so I was pumped, you know, when you're excited about something, you wake up super early. And so my morning started at 4.36. I just could not go back to sleep. And I was talking to Pastor Cheryl and she's like, yeah, I got up really early too. And that's the pastor heart, you know. And it's just such a joy to see, you know, Westside, Coastal, and perhaps other churches here together worshiping. It's wonderful. It's a gift. And so since um, the last Good Friday service, there's a song that's been burning in my bones. It's an ancient song. It was the anthem of the early church. And in Philippians 2, the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, unpacks the implications of that anthem. And so it goes in Philippians 2, verses 3 to 11. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility value others above yourselves. Not looking to your interests, but each of you looking to the interests of others. Can you imagine what Vancouver would be like if believers lived like that? And it goes on to say, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. But rather, what did he do? He made himself low. He humbled himself. He took on human likeness. And the song continues. Taking on a human appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. And I love this word in scripture where it says, therefore... Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven, on earth, under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. There's a reason why we do this together. We don't do this in our own rooms in isolation. Because you see, the cruciform love of our Savior not only restores our vertical relationship with God, but it restores our horizontal relationships with one another. So it makes so much sense that the deeper that you go with Jesus, you cannot help but to love others. How can we not forgive when he has forgiven us? How can we not show grace when he's shown us grace? Right? And every time we take this bread and cup, it's an incredible thing that happens. We say yes and amen to the prayer of Jesus that's found in John 17, where he says, Father, Make them one as we are one. I in them, you in me, make that unity complete. And the staggering part of that prayer is that ending portion of it where Jesus says, then the world will know 
that you have sent me and love them. Our unity demonstrates for the world that God sent his one and only son. It's an incredible thing. And so as I think about this city, there's one thing that I am quite sure of. Whether this city recognizes this or not, there is this deep, deep hunger and longing for the sort of love that only Jesus can satisfy. I believe that with all my heart. And so with that in mind, would you join me in prayer before we take these elements. Living God, we thank you for the power and truth of what's found in Romans 5, 8. That you, God, demonstrate your love for us. That while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. We thank you for the cross. We thank you that Jesus lived the life that we could not live. And died the death that we deserve. And so we fall and worship at the feet of Jesus this moment. As we take the bread and the cup, help us to remember not just your love for us, but the love that you've called each of us to extend to others in this family, in this place, in this city. We love you. We praise you. Spirit, lead us in Christ's name. Amen. So we're going to give a minute or two for the servers, the ushers, to hand this, these out. So if you want to partake and have not have a chance to get one, will you raise your hands? And then someone will come along to serve you. So we'll take a minute or so to allow time for this to be spread. And then we'll take the elements together. So I told the folks uh, from the first service uh, that this is my second time doing this with you all. Uh, until I do this like maybe 10 times, I won't call myself the resident expert on this thing. But I do know that if you take the first film, you get the cracker. And then the second one will get you to the drink. So Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body given for you, the body of Christ for you. the same way he took the cup. This is the blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. The blood of Christ for you.
Psalm 22, verse 27 to 31, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down before him, for dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. And all the rich of the earth will feast and worship, and all who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn. He has done it. He has done it. So Jesus, we thank you for the cross gave ourself, you gave yourself for our pardon. We thank you and we rejoice in the love and the grace you've shown. We thank you, Jesus, for the grace it is to gather as your people and to remember the cross and to worship you. We love you, Lord. I'm going to read this benediction for us as we go. To him, who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom of priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen.